and um, being able to take the time to study for it and pay for the MCAT itself and pay for the applications, all of that is tied to coming from some amount of money or privilege. Um, so there's actually a lot of motion movement towards getting rid of requiring um, exams, even stuff like the MCAT or the LSAT um, and making it optional, but not penalizing people who don't take it. So um, keep an eye on that as well. A lot of those requirements are sort of changing um, to benefit people who have less resources. Um, so we're going to talk about NMR today, which is also one of the, one of the ways that um, OCHEM directly interacts with medicine, um, because like I mentioned before, MRI is based around the same principles here. We're just studying different things and processing the signals differently um, in order to give us information about a person's body versus um, just getting information about a single chemical. Um, but they work based on the same principles, um, which is, and the, it's kind of weird because um, you guys remember electron spin, right? Electrons can be spin up or spin down. Um, turns out anything with an odd number of quarks um, or fundamental particles also has spin. And if you look at um, the nucleus of an atom, so all of our electrons in organic chemicals are for the most part, they're all paired up, right? So there's no net spin one way or the other. There's no magnet magnetic field generated by the molecules themselves, by the electrons. Um, but anytime you have an odd number of protons and electrons, you actually wind up with the nucleus itself has spin, which we refer to as non-integer spin. Basically, as long as you have an odd number of nucleons, an odd number of neutrons plus protons, your nucleus itself has a magnetic field to it which is a little bit weird because we don't think about organic compounds as being magnetic. Um, and it turns out you just, you have to get to really strong magnetic fields to be able to notice it, but the individual atoms themselves have these magnetic fields. Um, and so if you have a sphere that has magnetic field, it's going to actually interact with other magnetic fields around it. I um, mean, basically you can treat it like it's a bar magnet. It's gonna line itself up so that you had a north end of the of the atom and the south end. And we usually would draw them the um, magnetic field lines as coming out of the north end and going towards the south end. So if you've taken physics, this should look familiar, um, even if you don't particularly like thinking about it. Um, magnets were always tricky. Magnetic fields were always the tricky problems. Um, until you got to circuits and then it was circuits, right? Um, but what that means is if you put it in a big enough magnetic field, you can actually see the individual nuclei lining up with it, with the external magnetic field. And it winds up, it lining up. So you can basically have two ways you can arrange the magnet. You can have it so that it goes with the, the external magnetic field or it can be 180 degrees and pointing the opposite direction of the external magnetic field. So, so just like if you have two magnets, if you put north end to the to south end of the other, they stick together. And if you try to flip it 180, they push each other apart, right? You have the same two options with these individual nuclei where they can be pointed with the magnetic external magnetic field or against the external magnetic field. And that, that means that you really have two different energy levels for each of these. If your magnetic field is strong enough, you can actually separate this into two different energy levels that are kind of like orbital energy levels. Um, and if you keep it in that magnetic field for long enough, what happens is you wind up with all of those individual nuclei that were randomly, their magnetic fields were all sort of pointed in random directions, they will eventually line up to be either most of them facing with the magnetic field, but a certain number will face 180 degrees into the magnetic field. 
Um, and <coughs> why this is helpful is if you have two different energy levels, if you think about when we were talking about electrons back in Gen Chem, if you had two different energy levels, you could promote an electron from one energy level to the other energy level by shining light on it, right? Or if it fell down from a high energy level and relaxed, it gave off light, right? So the, the difference in energy here is really, really small. You can't see this visibly. It doesn't produce visible light, but we can actually measure the difference in energy between these two states by shining a radio, source, um, radio wave source on it and measuring what frequencies does it give off when it settles back into that magnetic field. And so what that winds up looking like is if we start on the left-hand side here, this is a lot of figures in a row. If you start on the left-hand side and move towards the right, you start with no, no order to all these different atoms. All the nuclei are pointed in random directions. If you turn on the magnetic field, they'll all line up so they point the same way. And then if you turn on a radio transmitter, that's, that is the right frequency of radio waves. Radio waves are just light that are lower in energy than, our, than the visible spectrum, lower in energy than IR even. Um, you can actually, when you shine light on it, you can get those to flip into that beta position, into the 180 degree, to flip the opposite to the high energy state. And so then if you then, if you get them all flipped to the high energy state by shining the radio frequencies, on, the right radio frequencies on, and then when you turn it off, they'll eventually all flip back the other direction. And when they do that, they give off frequencies that are the same as the energy split that we were looking at before. When it flips from pointing the wrong way to pointing the right way, that extra energy is turned into a radio wave that we can measure. And so what an NMR is actually measuring, what an MRI is actually measuring is um, usually the, the simplest form is it's looking at what is the energy that it takes to flip these things back and forth and how big is the signal. So it's sort of like an IR in a lot of ways. We're still looking, we're still probing it with light and watching what light is absorbed or emitted. In this case, we're looking for light that's emitted, not absorbed, um, which is why it's still referred to as spectroscopy and an NMR spectrum, because we are still looking at light, even though our units are going to be even weirder than IR. Um, and so this is what a spectrum kind of looks like. Um, and it's, for, again, for whatever reason, they count from the right-hand side towards the left-hand side. And the units are not in units of wavelength. Um, they're in parts per million, which has to do with, um, it's related to the frequency, but it's been transformed even further to mathematically to separate these signals out. Um, and so the units are essentially not, don't mean much of anything, but they can still give us a good idea of what we're looking at, but based on where the different peaks show up similar to ion. Um, and so like IR, there are a few important things to look for. One of the things that's nice about NMR is you don't get a fingerprint region where there's useless information, where there's a bunch of stuff that just gunks everything up. Everything you see in an NMR is useful. And generally speaking, you can look at the number of signals, the number of different peaks that you have, and I'm including all of the, and for reasons I'll talk about in a second, all three of these peaks are considered one signal. And this is one signal. And this, I'll talk about it in a second, but that's probably several signals kind of overlapping. Um, but the interesting thing about the number of signals is it tells you the number of distinct protons. So remember, this is, we're um, looking at anything, we can use NMR to study anything with an odd number of nucleons, 
but the most common thing to use is proton NMR, which is, means we're looking because a hydrogen atom has just a single proton in it, right? They're in the nucleus, there's no neutron. So there's um, only one proton, which means it has spin to it, which means we can measure it with NMR. So proton NMR, the number of signals is gonna tell us the number of distinct hydrogens that we have, that we can tell apart from each other. Which all of a sudden, this just based on that, if I just said that, that the number of, of signals tells you the number of hydro types of hydrogens you have, that's what you, some of you guys were looking for in the IR lab last week, right? That instinct when you looked at the IR lab, when you're looking at the carbon hydrogen bonds, was to try and say, well, I've got, I've got three little peaks that are all in that right below 3000 range. So that means I have three different types of hydrogens, right? And I'd say, nah, there's other stuff that can get in the way there. This is what tells you exactly how many hydrogens you do have to work with, how many types of hydrogens. Um, second, just like with IR, where it shows up, what the, the chemical shift where the peak shows up tells us something about um, how much electron density the protons have around them. And we'll go through, I have examples for each of these sections. So I'll explain them in more detail when we get there. Um, the integral under each signal is proportional to the number of protons that are in that signal. So this signal right here between two and three, um, if we look, that tells us that there are a, there is at least one proton that is unique from all the other protons that shows up in this area. If we integrate this peak, we look at the area under the curve like we did with the GC peaks and compare it to the others, that'll tell us how many hydrogens we have in each of these signals. So not just does, it, does NMR tell us how many types of hydrogens we have, it also tells us how many hydrogens are in each type of hydrogen. Of attached to each environment is one way that we've described it. And then lastly, the splitting, meaning how the signal shows up as one signal shows up as more than one peak, and they tend to be somewhat bell curve shaped, tells us how many hydrogens are nearby. So there's a ton of information about the actual structure here. We're only looking at hydrogens though, so it won't tell us things like um, you have a carbonyl group because a carbonyl doesn't have any hydrogens involved. So carbonyls won't show up in this. It won't tell you things, um, it, it will give you some supporting information that helps you interpret the IR as well. Is that an OH group or is that a carboxylic acid can be, can be helped by the proton NMR because of the chemical shift as well. So there are a lot of similarities, but there's even more detail to an NMR because you actually can analyze every bit of the NMR and get information from it, as opposed to just saying everything below 1500 is out the way we did with the IR. So when it comes to the where the signals are, um, we describe the spectrum as um, the position as being upfield or downfield. Um, upfield means closer to the right, which means closer to zero. And zero is defined as um, where tetramethyl silane shows up. It's basically an arbitrary distinction. We're just going to call this zero because everything that's organic shows up to the left of that, shows up um, downfield from zero. And so the further they are to the left, the more downfield they are. We, we also describe those as being more de-shielded. And de-shielded means that you've pulled electron density away from those hydrogens. So the more you have something like a, um, an OH group is going to be very de-shielded because oxygen is really electronegative. And so the hydrogen doesn't have much electron density around it. Um, and the further they are to the right, the more electron density they have. So the further upfield 
is more electron density, further downfield is more deshielded. So, and then we, we also have characteristic frequencies um, where we can look for certain things. And the further you are to the right, the more likely you are talking about an alkane group because alkanes are the hydrogens that are most shielded. So I know there's a lot of stuff in here, but the biggest ones to look for are aromatics, um, show up in a really, really characteristic position, as do um, vanillic hydrogens show up more downfield than all of these most of them anyway, um, are gonna be sp3 hydrogens, carbon hydrogen bonds. Um, as you keep going further, carboxylic acids show up all the way down here. They're all the way down above 10 ppm. Aromatics show, show up right around seven usually. And then everything else, we kind of just use it as a sliding scale, like, well, it's more de-shielded than the other one, which means it's closer to the electron withdrawing group. And so that allows us to sort of put things in order. I know I've got a CH2 here and a CH3. Um, how do I know which one is closer to the, to the oxygen? What's the one that's more de-shielded is closer to the oxygen? Right, so, and again, we'll go through some practice the rest of, of this, once I get through these slides, is going to be just practice. And what I mean by that is I will interpret them with you guys um, before I just dump you into the deep end for your assignment. So when I said that these ones down here, I didn't really, I didn't really specify how many signals I would think about that as being. Um, that's because it's showing up in that aromatic region, right around seven, seven to eight, which means I don't know how many hydrogens I have here necessarily, but I know that whatever I have in this group is attached to a benzene ring probably. These ones that are further upfield are in that alkane region where we would normally expect to find sp3 carbons. The hydrogens that are attached to sp3 carbons are gonna be in this area between, between or upfield from four at the most. So I don't know how many different hydrogens I have mixed in here yet. And I'll show you one way we can think, we can figure that out later. But I know that um, it's almost certainly on a benzene ring. So just the same way that with your IR, you guys were trying to look for evidence based on the molecular formula that you had a benzene ring. Like, uh, how else do we get that few hydrogens, right? And so we just said, well, there's sp2 carbon hydrogen bonds and the formula looks like it's probably a benzene ring in there. This is really, really good evidence that, it's a, that there is a benzene ring present. Because if I go back for a second, very little other stuff showed up in the same area between six and eight. Amides, but amides are pretty, pretty unique in that they have a nitrogen involved. So if you don't have a nitrogen, you can't have an amide. Phenols, again, are fairly unique in that you've got a benzene ring and then an OH. So they will, sh and they will even show more shielded than the benzenes. Um, so it's a very, very strong piece of evidence that we have a benzene ring here. So that all is kind of similar to IR, right? Kind of makes sense. We've got certain ranges where we're looking for certain functional groups. Um, here's where it gets more specific than IR. So remember that I said that the integral of each signal is proportional to the number of protons in that signal. So you might not necessarily know how many protons there are, then the units might not mean anything. You can't just integrate it and have it spit out a number of protons. But if you look at the area under each curve, 
you can say that, okay, well, this, this curve is twice the size of that curve. So I must have twice as many hydrogens that are attached to carbons in this environment as I have in that other signal. And so it's a lot like doing empirical formula back from Gen Chem, where we could just figure out the relative ratios of how many moles we had of things to each other. And if you didn't get a whole number ratio, you should at least get a really even fraction, right? If you got one to 1.5 was your ratio in your empirical formula, you could say, okay, well, I know I can't have 1.5 oxygens, so it must be two to three. Or if you got something really close to a one third, you wind up with, um, you know, with uh, a ratio that looks like 1.333. That's really probably a four to three ratio. And so that's what we see here. If we integrate these, and it, usually the integral sign that they use kind of looks just like a red line that kind of, it'll either just specifically have a number next to the peak, or they'll have like this little, wavy line that's kind of just showing you what the area is um, starting here and ending here. And so if we compare those peaks to each other, that gives us a ton of information as well. Because that allows us to say things like, um, well, if I have two hydrogens here and three here and three there, that allows us to say, well, those two that are those two groups that are three protons each, how do you get three protons attached to the same carbon? It's almost certain those are gonna be methyl groups. CH3 is attached to something else. And if you get an integral of two, that you've got a CH2 group, or you have two identical carbons that each have one proton on them. Right, so it gives us a lot of information about just how many of each of these things we have. So number of signals is how many distinct protons we have. The integral of each signal tells us how many protons are in that distinct group. Right, so let's, let me do, a, let's do a practice real quick of what I mean about just by distinct group. So if I said, if we were looking at um, ethane, and remember that the proton and MR, we're really looking at the hydrogens themselves, not the carbons directly. We can only tell information about the carbons by looking at the hydrogens that are attached to them. All of these protons are identical to each other. We can't tell the difference between any of these because they're, this is a totally symmetric molecule. And if I took this, this hydrogen, if I took this hydrogen, I flipped the whole molecule so that this hydrogen was over there, I'd have the same molecule, right? There's no difference between the two carbons, which means there's no difference between the two hydrogens, the hydrogens that are attached to the carbon. So this would only show up as one signal in an NMR because you only have one type of hydrogen. If we look, if we looked at propane or butane, Now we have two distinct carbons, two, dis two carbons we can tell apart from each other. If I pick the carbon at random, it's either a primary carbon or the secondary carbon, right? The two primary carbons are still identical to each other, but the one in the middle is different than the two on the ends. This would show up as two signals. You'd have one signal that was all of these hydrogens together, then you have a second signal that would be these hydrogens. Right? And the integral of the two signals would tell us something really important here. The integral of the two signals would tell us, okay, not 
not only do I have two signals, I now have two distinct types of hydrogens. But if, if I look at this at the NMR and the integral is three to one, because I have six protons that show up on the primary carbons and only two that show up in the middle. So if I looked at the integral for this, we won't worry about the peak, peak splitting yet. I looked at the integral and said, okay, well, this one is, um, is uh, three times bigger than this one. That tells me that this peak goes with these outside hydrogens. And what's more, it allows us to tell some the difference between like propane and butane. So propane is a three to one ratio of our two signals, right? If I looked at butane, butane still is only gonna have two distinct protons, or sorry, two distinct signals. Because these two primary, these two secondary carbons are identical, and these two primary carbons are identical, so still only two signals. But now I have a four to six ratio instead of a two to six ratio. When I look at the integrals, the ones that I circled in black, the primary carbons, there's six of them, and there's four secondary hydrogens. So now the integral on my, on my NMR, when instead be, of being three to one, it's gonna be three to two. Right, so the number, the integral paired with the number of signals you have and what that, those ratios are gives you a lot of information about how things are arranged. It can tell the difference between methyl propane versus butane. Right, two things that two are two different isomers that are almost identical to each other. So methyl methyl propane looks like that versus butane. If we count all the hydrogens here, in both of these cases. Both of these cases, we're going to get two signals, right? You're going to get the methyls that are the primary carbons in methyl propane are going to be one signal, and that tertiary carbon is a different second signal. Here, you're going to get two signals as well, the primary carbons and the secondary carbons. But the integral tells you the difference between them because the integrals for the signal for the um, the system on the left for the methyl propane, you're going to get an integral that was nine to one because you have nine protons on primary carbons and only one on the tertiary carbon. Versus over here, you're going to have those together and then these together. So you're going to get six to four or two to three ratio. So just looking at the integration can allow us to distinguish between two different isomers because we can't measure that directly, right? We can't measure which isomer might we have. If we know it's C4H10 and that's all we know about it, NMR or IR won't tell us the difference because it's all just a bunch of sp3 carbon hydrogens, right? But NMR really, really quickly and simply will tell us, oh, it's methylpropane or, oh, it's butane, All right? So those, the number of signals is important as in, especially when you couple it with the integral, right? Where you see the peaks is the one that, that translates most directly from IR. You're just matching up. This is where we usually see this section. These, other examples are a little bit trickier. The other pieces of information require a little bit more practice to see.
And it's a little bit like trying to build a 3D puzzle in your head where you don't even know if you have all the pieces. It's like it's, it does take practice. I recognize that. Um, here's another, this is another way that you sometimes see the integral drawn is you just have basically it's it's a lot like the way we added up our integrals for for GC where we just said okay the difference um, dx times the signal and then we just added all those rectangles together that's basically what we do here and so if you have a bunch of peaks that are kind of on top of each other um, we don't necessarily know if that's one signal or a bunch of signals we know it, based on the fact it's down at 6.5, it's probably aromatic. But when we integrate it, we just look, okay, where does it start? Where does it end? So we would, and then we compare the difference in heights for the red line, for the integral line to each other. Um, usually by just, if you don't have the raw data in front of you to actually do the math or, or get the numbers for it, you just, eyeball it and it should be really close to a whole number ratio. Um, take a piece of paper, find the smallest one, which would probably be this one right here, and take a piece of paper and hold it up to the screen or print it out and get a ruler out. But if, so if you, you know, just hold a piece of paper, say, okay, there's my, that's my smallest peak and then use it, hold it up next to your other peaks and it should either be if it's a one to two ratio or a three to, three to one ratio, it should be pretty obvious when you do that, just by holding it up, what that ratio is to each other. Most of the time these days, it's actually gonna get just be called out. They will have already done it for you. Even if it's not integers, it might be one to one and a half, but they will already have numbers assigned for it where they just call the smallest peak one. And if I was measuring this, this, if we're calling this one, this is probably two. This difference on the peak towards the right looks bigger than the one I marked two. So that's probably a three. And this one all the way to the right hand side looks really similar in size to the one I already marked two. That's probably two. And then over here, that gets a little bit trickier. I would probably actually want to maybe hold up, hold up my thumb to the two and see if it's twice as big. Not quite twice as big. So maybe that's also a three, a three, maybe a four. Um, and when I give you guys these as PDFs, um, a lot of PDFs have a measuring tool built into them. Um, mine is not Adobe, but if I pull up the um, these slides, which I did upload uh, a few minutes ago when I finished them. There's usually some measuring tool in here. Of course, it doesn't help that I've got my Zoom toolbar is in the way. Um, what is that program you're using? Um, it's a, a PDF exchange editor. It runs a lot lighter than Adobe. I really don't like Adobe because it always tries to run in the background and update itself and takes up all of your system resources. Um, course they've updated the format so I can't find my measuring tool now. There it is, rulers. At the very least this gives you an ability to say okay three three seventy to you know, three or three hundred. Then you could take those numbers, the difference there and figure it out. Um Adobe, there's definitely a measuring tool. I just have to, would have to find it. So I'm, I'm not going to do that right now. 
um, I'll we'll do that after we've gone through um, these uh, these slides. Um, and I'll I'll find up where it is in Adobe as well to show you guys. All right. So so far we've got number of signals tells us a fair bit of information actually doesn't seem like it on the face of it but knowing the different number of unique protons you have actually does tell you a fair bit about the structure um the where the peaks show up tells you a fair bit as well especially when it comes to finding aromatic rings because they always show up in really distinct areas um the integral tells you the ratio of the protons on each carbon and the last one is the is a little bit trickier to wrap your head around even than those. And it's called peak splitting. Um, so remember when we were looking at those others and I said, well, don't worry about it right now, but even though that looks like three different things, we're gonna call that one signal. Um, the reason that we called that one signal is because it's really one proton that's being split into different energy levels that are all really close together based on the number of hydrogens nearby so that all of the protons that are attached to the same carbon are going to be more or less identical so we can't tell the difference they're all going to be one signal but the hydrogens that are attached to the adjacent carbons the beta carbons will still interact with that and throw off the magnetic field a little bit and what that looks like and when i say throw off it it actually is useful because if you wind up with two protons neck on an adjacent carbon, there are actually four different ways you can arrange those. You can have them both be spin up, one spin up, one spin down, the reverse, one spin up, one spin down, or both spin down. And that the difference in, in those energies shows up as this peak splitting, where it's one signal that's been broken up into three tiny peaks that are all considered one signal. And it always is going to be based on how many carbons are attached to the beta carbon that you're looking at. So if the carbon for the signal, if we can call that alpha, the beta carbons are the carbons next door, just like we're talking about with our elimination reactions. The number of beta protons, the number of protons attached to the beta carbons will tell you what the splitting should look like. If you have two hydrogens next door, your signal will turn into a triplet, will turn into three peaks on top of each other. If you have three hydrogens next door, the number of ways you can arrange them turns it into a quartet. So the number of peaks that it is split into, not only, so we've got number of signals, position of the signal, the integral of the signal, and then we also have information about what's nearby based on the splitting. Right. And we're not always going to need all four of those pieces of information to solve this. Sometimes you can get by without the integral, for instance, if you can look at the splitting and tell something and recognize some pattern. Um, it's but this in the splitting is follows what's called the n plus one rule. N is the number of protons nearby, plus one is the number of, of ways you can arrange them. So if you have three protons near next door, there are four different ways they can interact with each other. So you would see three protons next door would turn into a quartet. Four hydrogens next door would look like a quintet. Five hydrogens next door would look like a sextet. And so that gives you a lot of information as well. Um, and so the and the relative intensities, as you start getting more possible ways of doing this, they start looking more and more like a bell curve. It's like the probability if you throw if you throw two six-sided dice, the highest probability outcome is going to be that you get a seven. 
because there are f six different ways you can arrange the dice to get a seven. And there are only five ways you can arrange the dice to get a six or an eight. You know how it sort of follows that normal distribution for those of you guys who remember your stats classes, if you've had it. Um, and so it winds up with that sort of general bell curve where the middle of it is always going to be higher than what's on the outside. But that overall shape to it can all, will also tell you that you're looking at all at one signal. If you've got a bunch of peaks right next to each other and they kind of follow the shape of a bell curve, that's probably all one signal. So let's practice. For getting the hang of some of this, it's easier to start from a structure and predict what it should look like than the other way around. So if we have this compound here, let's figure out what each signal, how many signals we should see, and then what this, the number of peaks, the multiplicity is the number of peaks in the peak splitting, and what the integrals might look like. And so if we're just looking at the number of hydrogens, the number of distinct hydrogens from each other, there's not much that's symmetrical about this molecule, right? You've got these two carbons are going to be identical to each other. Those two methyl groups, you can't tell the difference. Let me fix my little mistake there. So these two methyls are going to be one signal. And this carbon here has a hydrogen on it too, right? It's only got three bonds drawn. So the fourth is a hydrogen. So that's going to be a signal. The carbonyl carbon doesn't have a proton on it, doesn't have a hydrogen. So it won't show up. We won't see a signal for that one. Sean, will you just re-say why it doesn't get a signal again? Because the signals only show up when we have, because the signals are measuring the protons, the hydrogens for each system. And so if the carbon doesn't have a hydrogen on it, it won't show up. Um, if we look, these two CH2 groups are gonna be different from each other because one's only one carbon away from the carbonyl and the second one is further away from the carbonyl. So they're, they're not the same. That carbon's a quaternary carbon, right? Got four bonds already, so it can't have any hydrogens on it. So that won't show up. And all of these methyls are identical to each other. But they're not the identical to the hydrogens on the methyls on the left side? Correct. Because the hydrogens, let me switch the color here to color code a little bit better. Um, the hydrogens on the methyls on the left-hand side are only two carbons away from the oxygen versus the methyls on the right-hand side are three carbons away from the oxygen. So they're not totally symmetrical, which means they well, you'll be able to tell the difference. Different signals. You'll get different signals, exactly. So we would expect this molecule to have five signals in the NMR. In general, the more symmetry you have, the more one side of the molecule looks the same as the other side of the molecule, the fewer signals you will have. Because anything that you can say, I can't tell the difference between these two carbons means you can't tell the difference between their hydrogens either. 
So if we wanted to, so we would expect a total of, let's get this written down for you guys, five signals. And the integral of each signal is going to be proportional to the number of hydrogens in that signal. So we can predict the integrals here relative to each other. The smallest integral is going to be the carbon that only has one proton attached to it, the dark green one. So one proton there. Then we're going to have two signals, the light green and the yellow, are both going to be twice as big. Or I guess that's more like, that's the orange color. What's the next largest integral going to be? Six with the red ones. There's six protons on the red, the carbon circled in red. And then the blue carbon is going to be then an integral of nine. Because we have three methyl groups, all of the methyl groups are CH3. So each methyl has three protons and there's three of them that are identical. The multiplicity for each of these is the, the peak splitting. We'll go in the same order here. I guess we'll go, actually, let's go from left to right. Let's do the red one first. There are six protons in the, on the red carbons, but they only have one neighbor, right? The carbon that they're directly attached to only has one hydrogen attached to it. And you add one to that to get the number of peaks. So we, the multiplicity for the red one we'd say is two. Or, and that would show up as a doublet. What would the multiplicity look like for the dark green for the next one from left to right? How many nearby neighbors does it have? This is where I get confused. I'm not sure if you should pay attention to the stuff on the right or the stuff on the left or both of them both, but only the carbons that are a single carbon away. It's like we can't jump from the green one here all the way over to the orange one, because that's two carbons away. That's too far away. But the hydrogens that are directly attached or are directly attached to adjacent carbons, there's six of them, right? So the dark green signal should be a septet should be seven of them, which is going to, is tricky to draw. It should look something like that. And right, so these signals have a lot of information in them. It's just a way of, you have to tease it out, remember what it, each piece is telling you, and then put it together in a way that makes coherent sense with how we draw structures and your molecular formula. What would your, the orange one would have a multiplicity of what? How many nearest neighbors are there? Would it be three in total? So there would be, the multiplicity would be three. There's two car hydrogens on the, the light green carbon and none on the carbonyl carbon. So it would show up as a triplet. 
and then the light green is going to show up there too, right? The light green has two neighbors that are on the orange carbon and no neighbors on the quaternary carbon. So the light green one has a multiplicity of three as well. So these are actually going to be the hard, probably the hardest two peaks to tell apart from each other when we actually look at a spectrum here, because they both are going to have an integral of two, and they're both going to be a triplet. So they're going to be kind of hard to just differentiate which one's the orange peak and which one is the green peak. We would, that's when we would have to then start looking at, okay, well, which one's closer to the oxygen? The one that's closer to the oxygen is going to be more downfield further to the left on the spectrum, right? So when you put all of the pieces together, it allows us to interpret this a lot. And then last but not least, what is our multiplicity going to look like for the nine protons on the methyls here? They're all directly attached to a carbon that has nothing, right? So the multiplicity would just be one. So it would show up as a singlet, just a single peak by itself. So we would have one really big peak that was a singlet that had an integral of nine. We would have a much smaller integral that had a multiplicity of seven. We would have two that are really similar to each other, where you've got an integral of two and a multiplicity of three for each of those. And then you would have a, a big peak with an integral of six and a multiplicity of two. Right, so every peak that you see on an NMR gives you this much information, enough information you can tell a lot about it. It gets kind of hard to tell whether that's a septet or a or a pen pentuplet sometimes. And it gets kind of hard. Sometimes the peaks will kind of fall on top of each other if they're really close to the same chemical shift. Um, and gets a little bit hard, especially with the aromatic hydrogens. Um, but the amount of information in a proton NMR, especially if you also have the formula, is almost always enough to figure out the actual structure, not just what functional groups you have, like, like ion. There's a lot more detail in an NMR, a lot more layers of analysis, which also means it's harder and requires a lot more thinking to make sense of it all. Any questions at this point? Okay. I'm gonna take that to mean that, I'm not going to interpret that to mean you know what you're doing yet, don't worry. Um, one of the, the easiest types of questions to answer with NMR is um, they call it peak matching, basically, or assigning the peaks. Um, and so what you, if you have an NMR spectrum and you know what the structure is, assigning the peaks just means basically saying, okay, this peak over here is this hydrogen or this group of hydrogens. So if we wanted to look at what are the if we wanted to assign the peaks to all of the different, right? first thing off, if you want to tell what the different hydrogens are. So we can go ahead and we can do that with and color code them like before. So butane only had two distinct hydrogens. If it's two chlorobutane, how many distinct hydrogens do we have? Three. Three. It's a good start. 
we can tell oh, four because it's not symmetrical because it's not symmetrical the two methyls are not going to be the same so we're going to have this hydrogen then we're going to have the methyl group that's that is next to the chlorine which is going to be different than the methyl group that's on the opposite side from the chlorine and then we have the two hydrogens that are secondary adjacent to the chlorine. All right, the other way to think about that, how you, how you know that the two methyls are gonna be different is that the methyl on the left would be a beta carbon if we did an elimination, right? And the methyl on the right wouldn't be. So they must be distinct from each other because they have different properties from each other. So if we wanted to assign which of these peaks in the signal goes with which color proton, what's gonna be the easiest one to figure out? Could actually start anywhere with this one. But what's the first Maybe thing? The smallest from? one. Smallest one? The integral is the easiest thing to look at, right? We have one signal that's only gonna have a single um, proton in it, which means it's going to be the smallest integral. And so if we look at these, that one looks distinctly smaller than all three of the ones on the right-hand side, right? So that's going to have an integral of one, which tells us it's probably this proton. And if we look at the other information, it kind of confirms it. We also, it's also the furthest to the left, which means it's the most de-shielded. In other words, it's the closest to something elect really electronegative. That'd be the chlorine. The one that's closest to the chlorine should be furthest to the left. We also have the multiplicity to look at. If you look at really closely here, there's one, two, three, four, five, six peaks there in that signal, which means it should be adjacent to five other hydrogens. Those, that's the orange and the blue, right? So the peak splitting, the integral and the de-shielding all agree with each other. They all tell us that this peak on the left is the red peak. We have one other one we can tell apart just based on the integral, right? The two methyls should show up with the same integral, but if we can point to one of these as being smaller, that'll tell us it's the CH2, the blue peak. Or if we look at this and say, well, the blue peak is adjacent to one, two, three, four other hydrogens. So it should be five, it should be a pentuplet in terms of the splitting. We look here and count, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, pentuplet. It's also pretty de-shielded, which we would expect from something that's, um, that is kind of close to the chlorine, not as close as our red proton. And if we looked at the integral, that integral compared to this one, it gets a little hard to tell by eye, but these look closer to the same size. And this one looks a little smaller. If you got out your ruler and even just held, literally held your ruler up against the screen um, or printed it out and measured it by hand, we would probably see the same thing. So this peak is our blue protons. And then the two methyls, we can also tell apart from two different ways of thinking about it. There is the, the orange methyl is closer to the chlorine than the green methyl, right? 
So we would expect the orange methyl to be further to the left and to be a doublet because it only has one hydrogen next door. So those two pieces allow us to tell which of the two methyls is which. Every time the wind blows particularly hard, I hear something fall over or bang against my house outside. And I keep wondering if, if the whole house is coming down because it's been real windy all day. Um, and then by process of elimination, we could, like I said, we could have started anywhere with any of these peaks because they all have enough information to allow us to assign them. You've got the integral, you've got the peak splitting, you've got where they are in terms of being shielded or deshielded. All of that together gives us a really, it's, there's very little wiggle room. If you get it right on an NMR question, you should know it because there's very little, if you, actually get a structure that matches the NMR, it should match really well. Other than maybe something like maybe on your, you have things too close on your benzene ring relative to each other. Um, and there's even minor details that you can get into past that, um, that where you can tell whether, whether something is cis or trans. If, if you have an alkene bond, you can tell whether it's E or Z based on the shape, is it skewed left or skewed right? Is the right-hand peak a little bit bigger than left-hand peak or vice versa? We'll tell you what, is it E or Z? Um, and if it's, if you're two things on a benzene ring and they're, if you have, that's our first substitution, you can actually look at the pattern in that aromatic region to tell whether or not, the other substituent is here versus here. We can tell that apart based on what the pattern looks like in the aromatic region, right? And we'll get there. Um, for now, we're going to get comfortable with the with smaller molecules, and I'll keep doing some more practice and let you guys try it first for some of these. But here's, here's a good example right off the bat. Without even knowing the chemical formula here or even having the integral, you can get to a decent idea of what this structure is. Um, I will, I'm making an assumption because I just grabbed this figure from the book so I don't actually know what this structure is, but I'm going to, I can be pretty certain that our integration would look like, um, let's see. I'm gonna divide everything by one. Let's see, the integral here is going to be one, 1.5 and 2.5. And the formula is going to be C8 H10. Yeah. So you could start by fixing the integration and tell, see if that tells you anything right off the bat. What do we know has to be different about the integration compared to the way it's written? Uh, whole, whole numbers. We can't have part of a proton part of a hydrogen. So we can't have 1.5. So at the very least, we need to multiply all these by two. The other thing you'll notice if your integration needs to be multiplied is that your integration won't add up to 
the number of hydrogens in your formula. So then this becomes three. This becomes five. Does that give us the right number of hydrogens? Gives us a total of 10, right? Sorry, Sean, did you say it's it's always going to add up to your total number of hydrogens? It should. If there's a possibility that you could have something that had 20 hydrogens, but when you add up the integration, you get 10. That just tells you you need to sure. double it again. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, it should if you have the only time that might not happen. Now, I, I think it should always add up to the same number as your hydrogens. Um, on, occasionally, an OH hydrogen won't show up in an NMR, depending on the type of NMR you have. And sometimes an OH proton will just not show up. So occasionally, you can be off by one. And that usually means you've got a hydroxide in there, an alcohol in there. I'm sorry, Elki. I'm not sure if it's you or me, but the connection's a little bad there. Yeah, I, I couldn't hear that either. Okay. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Also, my my power's been going out. I don't know if anyone else is hearing, but um, the C A H ten. Do I sound? Do I sound bad? <laughs> it's not that bad. Okay. Giving you a hard time. Um, the, the C8H10, you just came up with that? I did based on what I think this spectrum is from, but I have a lot okay. more experience than you. I think I could figure it out without knowing the formula because I know what I'm looking for and I've practiced it a lot. I don't expect okay. you guys to be there right now. So assume that that's correct. And I will okay. be giving you that. So what is one possibility? So integration is, is one easy tool that allows us to tell some important things. What else was, the, what's the simplest thing that we looked at as far as being able to interpret it? The one that was most similar to IR. Uh, the aromatic ring. Aromatic rings that where things showed up on the chemical shift told you a lot too, right? So if I go back to that figure real quick, the aromatic rings showed up in that six to eight and a half or so range. If you something shows up there, it's either an aromatic, a phenol, which means an OH group attached to an aromatic, or it's an amide. Since we don't have nitrogen or oxygen, it can't be either of those. So these hydrogens all over on the left-hand side that we have five of, that's actually a lot of information there. That, that actually tells us where a bunch of our carbons and hydrogens are, right? Because what does that tell us? Yeah, benzene ring. We got a benzene ring. And a benzene ring that has five hydrogens attached to it instead of six, that tells us something too, right? We only have one thing attached to the benzene ring. Benzene by itself would be six hydrogens, right? And so if you have C5, if you have C6H5, that tells you that you've got one thing that's not a hydrogen attached to the benzene ring. I counted wrong. It's not C8. Yeah, it is. It's C8. Never mind. I'm better than I thought I was. So what are, where are the other two carbons? We have two carbons left, right? And five hydrogens left. What does it look like? You got an ethyl coming off of there somewhere. Got an ethyl coming off. And it doesn't matter where you draw it, because all those carbons are identical to each other. 
but the the integrals and the peak splitting, especially the peak splitting, um, tell us ethyl an ethyl group will always show up as something like this, where you're going to have an integral of two and an integral of three. The integral of three mm -hmm. is the is the methyl is the terminal carbon, and it has a multiplicity of three as well, right? You got a triplet here, which means it has two nearest neighbors. So the green hydrogens, the ones at the end are gonna be which of these two peaks? The one you have three of. And the blue. And, that, and our, again, our multiplicity agrees. You have three nearest neighbors for those blue hydrogens, right? Because the methyl has three hydrogens on it, and the, this carbon on the benzene ring has no carb, no hydrogens on it. Right? So without knowing much about this, because remember when I first looked at this, all I saw, I didn't have the integral on there. I was just guessing, well, I know I've got something that's a benzene ring. And I know that this pattern of a triplet next to a quartet is an ethyl group. So I have an ethyl attached to a benzene ring. And when you, if we actually numerically integrated this, we would see that these, unless I totally missed my mark, it's possible it could be diethylbenzene. And then the integrals would be different because diethylbenzene would have same number of distinct carbons because these carbons on the opposite side would be indistinguishable from each other, right? And so based on what the integration is, if we had the integration numbers actually given to us, or if we had the formula given to us, we could distinguish between is it diethylbenzene or just ethylbenzene. So I was kind of guessing for the sake of, of doing this problem, usually you will be given um, the, in, both the integration and the molecular formula just like I did for you before I, I turned you loose on it. All right. So again, I don't expect you guys to be able to do this blindfolded without all the information. You should have enough information. In fact, usually you'll be given, I think for all of your problems in the, in the um, assignment this week, you're given both an IR and the molecular formula and an NMR, which means the IR you can use to tell what functional groups you have and the NMR you can use to tell how things are arranged. Once you know what all the pieces are from your IR, you can tell how things are hooked up and arranged by looking at the NMR, right? Is your chlorine on carbon one or carbon two? Is your OH group on carbon one or carbon two of butane is one butanol is going to look have a very different um, is going to have a very different NMR than two butanol. Right, so when you put all of it together, I'll walk you through one where you have both pieces of information. So let's say we've got C six H twelve O two. We've got a formula. Probably it's not going to be a benzene ring because we have too many hydrogens and oxygens for the number of carbons. Plus, when we're looking at the IR, remember that these peaks down here, if you don't have anything to the left of 3000, then you don't have any sp2 hydrogens, carbon hydrogen bonds. Right? So the fact that our carbon hydrogen peaks are to the right of 3000 tells us that they're all going to be sp3 carbon hydrogens 
other than maybe an aldehyde. Remember, aldehydes showed up by themselves a little bit away from the other type of carbon hydrogen bonds. So if I was interpreting this from scratch, I would say, okay, well, maybe that's an aldehyde. And you can just write it in there and say, question mark. Here we can say pretty definitively that we've got sp3 CHs. And then we've got a big, strong, well-defined peak right around 1700. So without having the sheet of the specific frequencies in front of me, I can still tell that that's probably a carbonyl. So we've got evidence that it might be an aldehyde. It's definitely a carbonyl. Definitely a lot of sp3 CHs, or not a lot, but there are no sp2 CHs. Right, so that gives us the pieces, and we don't know what to do with those yet, but if we then turn around and look at, and so I'll, I'm going to write this on the board before I switch to the next slide that has the NMR. and C6H12O2. And then we add SP3 CHs. We definitely don't have an OH because there's nothing to the left of 3000. There's no big broad peak there. we might have an aldehyde, we're not sure about that. But we definitely have two oxygens because that's given in the problem statement. So then if we are, if we get an NMR that looks like this and that pay no attention to that 17, that's not noting anything, that's a slide number that didn't get deleted. Um, So how the heck do we interpret this to match this structure and the information we have from the IR? Well, we have, first off, we can count the number of signals. Sometimes that's all it takes. We've got one, two, three, four, five signals. So out of our out of our six carbons, five of them we can tell apart from each other. And the sixth one is a, do is a double of one of the others. So first off, let's talk about the oxygens. Sean, could it also be tetrahedral and not having hydrogen on it? Could it be? And so not have a signal then, a, therefore? A, yes, sorry, that's the other option, is that we have something we have a carbon that doesn't have a hydrogen on it, which is a, definitely a possibility since we know we have a carbonyl in there somewhere. We can kind of rule out aldehyde actually at this point because aldehydes show up in a very distinct region here. Aldehydes show up all the way up at 10. And carboxylids carboxylic acids are up above 10. So the fact that we don't have anything up in that 10 region tells us it's not a carboxyl or not an aldehyde. Can I ask an off topic question? Maybe, I might tell you to hang on to it, but go for it. <laughs> that thing you were just showing, how come there's no esters on there? Because what does an ester look like? A carbonyl with an oxygen next to it. So an ester would look like this, right? Yeah. 
would that show up in a proton NMR? Oh, because there's no hydrogens. Okay. There's no hydrogens. So this is definitely a possibility. That could be our fifth or sixth hydro or carbon could be the carbonyl carbon, and we could have an ester. The fact that it we don't have it, we definitely don't have an aldehyde, and we definitely know from the IR we don't have an OH or a carboxylic acid. So the options for what we could have for two hydro or two oxygens to be in there, they will still give us five distinct carbons that have protons on them is pretty limited. Ester is a really good option here. So we could be fairly certain now we have an ester of some, some sort. And then all we have to do is figure out how do we arrange the other five carbons that make it match this NMR. So we could have, and the integration can help with this too. Um, but the fact that we have five distinct, five distinct carbons means that we we are not going to have a methyl group that's on carbon two on either side, right? Because then we would have two identical methyls and they would show up as one signal, right? So we can't have any carbons that we have left can't show up as the same carbon. They can't be identical to each other. You do a ethyl and a propyl, it would be five and seven makes 12. Five and seven makes up, we have an ethyl and a propyl. So if we had CH2, CH2, CH3, and then on the other side, we could have CH2, CH3. That's a really good option. This one can't be arranged as a methyl because where we have a methyl here, because then we wind up with two groups that were identical to each other, right? The only other option we could have is you could have CH3 on one side, you could have a methyl on one side of the ester and a butyl on the other. Right? Because then we'd have. We still have the same formula. So how can we tell the difference? And how can we tell what's attached to which side of the ester? Because the two sides of the ester are not identical, right? Sean, actually, what if you, well, if you, sorry, Cody, but if you have two ethyls on each side, wouldn't, isn't it not, uh, wouldn't there be different shielding? So wouldn't they actually be different signals? So couldn't you have it the same? You, you could, except we have an odd number of carbons left. Oh, right. You're right. The, Not counting. <laughs> it's, it's tricky to keep all of this together in your head at once. It takes practice. Um, we're down to basically four options, though. And this, the peak splitting might be what tells us the difference. Because either way, when we do the integral, we're going to have two, two CH3s, and we're going to have three CH2s, right? So we, sh we should have three signals that have an integration of two and two signals that have an integration of three. So the peak splitting though, will be different between the, the two different options, right? Because if we have, this one has two nearest neighbors. And try and remember to color code it here. Um, this one would have five nearest neighbors. And then you would have your final would have two nearest neighbors again. So, and then on the other side, so we'd have multiplicity of 
three, multiplicity of six, multiplicity of three. Or in other words, a triplet, a sextuplet, a sextet, and another triplet on this side. And on the other side, we would have a triplet and a quartet. And when we look here, we've got a quartet and actually, so here's the other option before we start getting into assigning this, the option below where we had a methyl on one side and a butyl on the other, um, the methyl on one side, regardless of which side it's on is gonna have no nearest neighbors, right? which means it would show up as a singlet or just a single peak. We don't have any of those. All of our signals have splitting, which means we don't have anything arranged with just a methyl by itself on one side of the ester. So that's out. So now the only thing left to do is determine is the which side is the ethyl on and which side is the propyl on. I feel like your ethyl should be connected to the oxygen because you got the four peaks down field or whatever. So this one we've got the the quartet that's all the way down field tells us it's directly attached to something really electronegative. That would be the quartet was the purple carbon. Right, no, sorry. The quartet was the methyl at the end. No, I had it right. It is the purple carbon. We have four or three nearest neighbors, so it's you got a quartet. And I'm running out of colors here. So the purple peak is all the way down field. And then we have a triplet, so three nearest neighbors. Sorry, it's two nearest neighbors, is pretty far down downfield. That's likely. the blue one, and that really the integration will tell the difference there because if it's the green, if it's the methyl group, it would show up as having an integration of three. All right, and so that's one, the two and the three are kind of hard to tell visually that I think our methyl groups are here, methyls tend to be more shielded because they have fewer things pulling electron density away from the hydrogens. So I think both of these are our methyl groups. And the, the peak splitting should help us tell the, tell the difference. They're both gonna be triplets and they're both gonna have an integration of three. And then we have the orange one has the most neighbors. It has five nearest neighbors, right? So it's got the most splitting. And it's not as downfield as the, as the triplet that we circled in blue. And then our two methyls are going to be the, I lost my mouse. There it is. Um, we've got the dark green and the light green. The dark green is going to be the one that's going to be more de-shielded, that's closer to the oxygen. And so, and then our light green would be that peak. And so filling in the section in the middle, we I actually drew the two substituents backwards relative here. So our, our purple 
um, carbon was the one directly attached to the oxygen. So we have, let's just draw it as a skeletal structure. Got our ester. On the side of the ester that has the carbonyl, we had our propyl group. And on the side that, that doesn't have the carbonyl was an ethyl group. But that's tricky to be able, especially to be able to come down and say, okay, well, which is, I figured out that it's an ethyl and a propyl, which side, which one goes on which, which side um, is a little, is really tricky, frankly, and takes practice. If you just got it down to, I know it's an ester and I know there's an ethyl on one side and a propyl on the other, that's 90% of the way there for this problem. And remember that process of elimination and what are the options and then how can I cross off options is the best way to do that. Based just on the formula, we could say, I know I've got oxygens. What functional groups do I have that have oxygen in them? And then we could cross off alcohols right away from the ion. We could cross off carboxylic acid right away from the ion. That only left us with a few options. It's basically, it's gonna be an aldehyde ketone or an ester and aldehydes and ketones we would need two different functional groups to do it right because each of those only has one oxygen in it so if you have two oxygens and you don't have any ohs esters are pretty common it's either going to be it's either going to be an ester um it could be an ether, but that does wouldn't be an OH, or sorry, it wouldn't be a carbonyl, right? So it's all about crossing off options and then saying, okay, what pieces do I have left that I still need to assign? Um, and I have some more practice problems that are in the um, in the background and intro PDF file. I separated them out because this is a 26 page PDF and I didn't want you to think you had to do all of them. So the last 10 pages is a bunch of IR and NMR data with formulas. Um, and your job is to figure out the structure for those 10 compounds. Right, and again, let me, let me close this and open up. The files here. And I will keep doing some more practice with these. Um, oh, another tool that we've kind of been using, but not officially, it goes through a lot of different ways. You can look at this, peak splitting, um, the other, the other tool that you get just from the molecular formula is the degree of unsaturation. Remember the number of hydrogens that are missing from a saturated compound tells you how many pi bonds or rings you have. You guys remember doing that way back when we first introduced alkanes and I said, you can look at degree of unsaturation. And then we kind of didn't touch it too much after that. If it's a saturated compound, that means you're going to have a ratio of carbons to hydrogens that looks like this, where you've got, I'll write that here. All right, so, and what that allows you to tell just from the formula then is, and if there's oxygen mixed in there too, that doesn't matter. If you just look at the ratio of hydrogens to carbons, that'll tell you how many, how many pairs of hydrogens are missing. And if the number of pairs of hydrogens that you're missing 
from this will tell you you have either a pi bond for each pair of hydrogen missing, you have either a pi bond or a ring structure. So for that last one where we had C6H12O2, ignoring the oxygen, C6H12, I have twice as many hydrogens as carbons. That's a, the degree of unsaturation is one. We're missing one pair of hydrogens, which means it's got either a pi bond or a ring, but not both. And sometimes if your degree of unsaturation is really high, if you're missing a lot of pairs of hydrogens, like C8H10, if it was saturated, it would be C8H18. And so I'm missing four pairs of hydrogen, which means I've either, I've got four, either four pi bonds or four rings or a mixture of the two. But that ratio, that degree of unsaturation of four is a pretty good indicator that you've got a benzene ring. Right, or if your degree of unsaturation, unsaturation gets even higher, you got even more pi bonds involved. All right, so that itself is a pretty useful tool without doing any interpretation of spectra, because that that itself can eliminate a lot of of um, possibilities. For instance, the example we just did. If I know I only have at most one pi bond, it can't be two ketones or it can't be a ketone in an aldehyde because then it'd be missing two pairs of protons instead of just missing one pair of protons. So that eliminates that possibility just by looking at the formula. And so I, that wasn't even really an option. So that really meant S, if it's not a diketone or an aldehyde and a ketone or some combination of those, and it's not a carboxylic acid or an alcohol, the only other functional groups we have are esters and ethers that have oxygen in them. All right, so don't, that is a very useful tool as well. And this, the background info goes through some practice with that as well. And I'm thinking I'll go through one or two more here um, where we have both the IR and the NMR. Um, and then uh, I'll turn you guys loose on the, on the report questions. And there's, I'm still looking for the measuring tool here. I know it's here somewhere. Um, the tools. Anyway, I will I will continue to try and find that. Um, there, distance. There it is. Okay, so I found mine on here so that will help for demonstrating these things. So this is a practice compound from the background. We're given a formula C4H10O and we're given an IR and an NMR. Right off the bat from the formula, what do we know about pi bonds? No pi bonds, it's saturated, right? It's saturated. We've got that, our number of hydrogens is twice our carbons plus two. Makes it saturated. So regardless of what type of functional group the oxygen is in, we have no pi bonds. What can we tell about the functional group for the oxygen by looking at the IR? Got nothing over 3,000, so probably not alcohol. 
nothing over 3000. So definitely not an alcohol or a carboxylic acid. We already knew car it wasn't a carboxylic acid because we only have one oxygen. So what's the only functional group left? That's only a single oxygen that with no pi bonds. It's an ether, I think. Right, an ether. So we have an oxygen linking together two carbons. How many ways could we arrange four carbons with an ether, with an oxygen in the middle? Two different ways? So we have, so we can't do four carbons in a row and then an oxygen because that would be an alcohol. We could do three carbons in a row and then an oxygen and then another carbon. Or we could do two carbons in a row, then an oxygen, then another carbon. What's going to be the easiest way to look at the NMR and tell which of these options it is? How many signals there are? How many signals there are? How many signals should we get from the top sample? Got three. Really four, four, four right? Because these two CH2s are different from each other. And the two methyls okay. are different from each other, too. So if it was the top example, we'd see four signals. And if it's the bottom example, it's symmetrical now, right? You can't tell the difference between that carbon and that carbon, because they're both next to a methyl on one side and next to an oxygen on the other side. So if it's if we look at the NMR and there's only two signals, that answers this problem right there. And all the more we dig in the NMR, it should all agree with this structure. So you would want to support your argument by saying by doing the assigning the different peaks. If these protons are this signal, these protons are that signal. Um, but it should be pretty easy to tell if we have the right compound because we only get two signals when we look at it. And they even did the integration for you. And we can't tell much about the peak splitting there because it doesn't have a high enough resolution. And that happens sometimes, but we don't need it because it tells us just by the number of signals and our integration matches this too, right? because it's a two to three ratio, which doesn't add up to 10 hydrogens. So the, but that's because these two are showing up as one signal and these six are showing up as the other signal. So it's a four, it's really a four to six ratio, not a two to three ratio, but numerically that looks the same. Right, so they're not always as complicated. Sometimes if you approach it from the point of view of use the process of elimination, what is even possible based on my formula? And then say, okay, what can I eliminate from my IR? You don't necessarily have to look at your IR as evidence that you have stuff. Sometimes it's more helpful to use your IR to say, what don't I have? Because that cuts down your possibilities a lot. So this is kind of a mess. We've got this big old thing right here. Our formula is C3H6O2. It's a fairly small molecule. If you've got three carbons and six hydrogens, what's our degree of unsaturation? How many pairs are we missing? Missing one pair. We're missing one pair, so we can have a pi bond or a ring, but not both. What does the IR point towards? 
should be a carboxylic acid, right? Right. Based on this is not just broad like an alcohol broad. This is way broader than that, right? The alcohols were big broad peak, but all of it contained above three thousand. This goes all the way down close to two thousand, which tells us carboxylic acid. Which means we don't even really need the NMR for this one because with only three carbons. There's really only one way you can have a carboxylic acid, right? Our three carbons, you have to have your carboxylic acid has to be at the end of the carbon chain because three of the bonds of a carbon are two oxygens in that case. So, because we would have That's really the only possibility. If it's, a, if it's a carboxylic acid that only has three carbons, there's no other way we can arrange it. So this one we could actually figure out just from the IMR. But our NMR should have how many signals? One, two, and three. And this one's gonna show up in a way different spot than the others. This one's gonna be way downfield. Right, so if we have, if our assumptions are correct, and that's what we see, right? We get two hydrogens and three hydrogens that are where we're used to seeing alkanes for the most part. And then we have one hydrogen all the way down at 12 parts per million. And our, our integration matches up as does our peak splitting. If you actually got in there and counted peaks, um, the one that has an integral of two has, it's a quartet, even if it's a little bit hard to see. And then that, the three hydrogens are a triplet. So that, that indicates that, that that characteristic shape of an ethyl group, right? An integration of two that has a quartet next to an integration of three that's a triplet is really indicative of an ethyl group. We haven't dealt much with nitrogens yet, but there's nothing spectacularly different about them. You just look for your functional groups. And we have a bunch of peaks up here, up above 3,000. That's an NH bonds. The fact that our formula is C3H9N tells us that we don't, it's not a complicated nitrogen group where there's more than one nitrogen or where you have an oxygen and a nitrogen, like an amide or something like that. It's going to be an amine. And the fact that you have a bond up here, an NH bond, tells us it's not. So if we just look at this formula, the, there are really three possible ways we could arrange it. You can have a nitrogen with three methyls attached. You could have an ethyl and then a nitrogen and then a methyl. So suppose you could have an, an isopropyl attached to the nitrogen. Or you could have an propyl group with a nitrogen and an NH2 on the end. So I guess there are four possible ways to arrange this. I believe these all match the right formula. What can we rule out just based on the IR? Uh, 
what was the bond that was showed if it shows up above 3000 an oh group would show up above 3000 be broad an nh bond would show up above 3000 and be a little bit more narrow so that's these peaks on the left hand side so i mean you have two hydrogens bonded to that nitrogen or possibly we don't want to but it means we have at least one which means this is out so we're going to be able to use the all we if we know we have the nmr as well we don't need to read too much into the ir from the formula we get a couple possibilities and then the IR might eliminate one or two, but then we should be able to predict what the NMR looks like just by looking at these structures, right? So this top one would have four signals, right? Because you've got your methyl, the CH2, the NH, and then another methyl. Is distinct from the first one. Here you should have four signals. Your NH2, and then a CH2, a CH2, and a CH3. Here you should only have three signals, right? Because it's you're going to have these are going to be the same, and then you have here. And you got your NH, your hydrogens that are on the amine. Right. So, right off the bat, we're going to be able to either pick a winner or eliminate one more just by the second we look at the NMR. We get one. We have it. They're all kind of close together. And I warned you that that happens sometimes, right? But just based on the integration, we have one and then two and then six that are all sort of lumped on top of each other. What is the one hydrogen that's by itself? It's your uh, tertiary carbon. Well, it could be either of these, right? Probably this one though, because I believe amines, if we check the um, the group here, amines show up further downfield. No, they're not they're not listed on here. Amides are further downfield, amides are not listed. Sean, would it be the bottom? Uh, wouldn't it be the one on the right just based off signal number? Or it's not even yeah. a When they're, no, you're, you're absolutely right. It's just when they get this close together and the resolution's not great, I get a, a little bit wary of trying to say that that's just definitively only two signals and not three signals on, on top of each other. Um, but if you look at the integration, it's kind of that matches up one to two to six. That definitely points to this one. And that's what I mean about even if you're pretty sure just based on the number of signals that it's this one, you still might want to double check because you could be missing a signal being buried underneath another one or think it's one signal when it's really two or the other way around, think it's two signals when it's really one. So you still want to make sure you can support it. But the, we would expect these ones, if it was this signal here, we would expect to be able to see all of these signals a little bit more distinctly because that's directly attached to a really electronegative element. And so is this one. So they should, they would, we would expect them to probably be further downfield. We'd have two signals further downfield and then two that were um, a little bit closer to zero. 
but the one, two, six. And normally, if we were taking this data ourselves, we would usually be able to zoom in and sort of spread it out a little bit, get a little bit more resolution, but it depends on how good the NMR is that you're using, um, exactly how much resolution you can get. It also depends on how cold you keep it. Most NMRs run on liquid nitrogen. They have to be, you have to keep things that are around liquid nitrogen temperatures. Um, but the really good ones um, run around, I mean, they, can, they can get signals like this at room temperature, but if you want better resolution, you have to cool it down to liquid nitrogen. And if you want really good resolution, you have to cool it down to liquid helium temperatures, which is about four Kelvin. All right, let's do one more with just the NMR and then I'll stop talking, which will be a relief for everyone, myself included. C8H10, that only has two signals. First off, how many rings could we have or pi bonds? None, right? It's saturated. No, sorry. I take that back. See, 8H10, it's double plus two. So if it was saturated, it would be C8H18. So we're missing four pairs. And if we're missing four pairs of hydrogens, What's a good convenient structure that has a degree of unsaturation of four? Ring of benzene. Benzene. Benzene's a ring and three pi bonds, right? For total degree of unsaturation of four. So six of our eight carbons are probably a benzene ring. And I didn't scroll down to show you this right off the bat because it was still too zoomed in. But this signal is all the way down at seven, which again, I told you was a really good indicator that you've got a benzene ring. Between the formula and the fact we've got a peak at seven, we've definitely got a benzene ring. And then we have only one other signal. And if you look at the integration, it says two hydrogens, three hydrogens. That doesn't add up to 10, does it? So it's probably four and six. Four of them. must be on the benzene ring because that's the, the one signal. And the fact that if you, instead of having a big mess of noise down around where the aromatics are, if you have one really, really distinct peak down at the aromatics, that tells you actually where they are. It tells you that all of the hydrogens on your benzene ring must be identical to each other. because otherwise you would have a bunch of sort of signals floating around on top of each other, like that first example I did with benzene, right? Where there was just a bunch of noise that I said, well, this, this is gonna integrate to five. It was a, we couldn't really do anything with the peak splitting. The fact that we have all of these are showing up as one single peak tells us they must all be identical to each other. And then what else do we know based on the formula? What else could we possibly have? Two methyl groups. Got to be two methyls. So this is our integral of six. 
this is our integral of four. All of the proton, all of the hydrogens that are on the benzene ring are identical to each other. And so we actually wind up being able to see pretty simply, it's not just that it's dimethylbenzene, we can tell where the methyl groups are. Because if it was switched, if, if it was this compound, if it was 1,3-dimethylbenzene, the hydrogens that are on the benzene ring are going to be distinct from each other. These two are going to be the same. But this one is different than those two. And this one's different than all three of the others. And so we would wind up with a bunch of stuff more than one peak showing up up there. It would be kind of, it would all integrate out to the same number of protons, but it wouldn't give us just one distinct peak. All right. So anytime you get you look at the at the aromatic region and you get a very one very distinct peak there. Um, you can't always trust the multiplicity, but you can say that it's just one peak. All of my hydrogens on the benzene have to be equivalent. So I've got to have something that's symmetrical. And I mentioned this earlier, but I'll say it again especially on low resolution NMRs, the multiplicity, the splitting, sometimes is really hard to actually read. So that might, that's probably not what you want to be your go-to for your first choice for figuring out what your structure is. You can use it to support a structure that you already think is right. But there are some weird things that happen like, um, we would expect each of these hydrogens that's identical, we would expect each of them have one nearest neighbor. And so it should show up as a doublet based on our regular rules. But the pi electrons in here kind of get in the way. And so they can, if you have pi bonds or hydrogens attached to a benzene ring, the, the peak splitting is not always reliable. So the, just the, the fact that we got one signal right there is indicative that we have only one type of hydrogen. Don't read too much into the fact that you're, it should be a doublet and it's not, because pi bonds do that to your splitting sometimes. Are those pi bonds why that's more uh, downfield too, because they're kind of electronegative? Um, yeah, exactly, because all the electron density in the benzene ring is in the ring itself, and very little electron density is actually going out to the hydrogens. The hydrogens aren't strong enough to pull electron density away from that aromatic ring, and so that's why it shows up all the way down there. And then the very next page actually has what it would look like if we had C6H4Cl2 which is going to be a benzene ring with two chlorines on it. And there are three possibilities for it. You could have the chlorines right next to each other. You could have the chlorines opposite of each other, or you could have the chlorines one carbon away from each other. So you have one, two dichloro, one, three dichloro, or one, four dichloro benzene. And the number of signals that show up in that aromatic region allow us to tell the difference. So look at compound G right here, just like the last one, it's gotta be symmetrical. So this is the one where you would have your, your two chlorines would be on opposite corners of your benzene. So it'd be one, four dichlorobenzene. Then there's one where you get a signal with one hydrogen, a signal three hydrogens versus one hydrogen and one hydrogen or really two hydrogens and two hydrogens. This would be the one where they're right next to each other because we'd get something, the only hydrogens in here 
we'd have these two hydrogens are identical and these two hydrogens are identical. So you wind up with two peaks that are the exact same size integral relative to each other versus the more complicated. We had one in three. It's a little bit harder to tell what's going on, but one in three is going to have to be where they alternate. Now, which one's the one and which one the three gets a little bit tricky based on resonance and stuff like that, but we can tell we can tell we have distinct protons from each other and it they're not going to be the same integration necessarily. The one where they were the exact same integration has to be the one where the two chlorines are right next to each other because the molecule is totally symmetrical. We get a one and a three. It can't be all the way symmetrical. And it's probably this is the one and these are the three because this one's adjacent to two chlorines. So it's more de-shielded than the other three. The aromatic, figuring out the substitution on a benzene ring is, is the, the trick, I won't say it's the trickiest, it's the most fuzzy part of NMR because sometimes all those peaks stack up on top of each other and it's really hard to see. Sometimes it's really obvious to see um, and it's not always predictable. So rely, do that last when you're trying to figure out your structure. Worry about where it is on the benzene ring after you've figured out everything else. All right, any questions? Just listen to me talk for another two hours. So you've already clocked four hours of Sean lecture time today. So Sean, can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. Um, on next Tuesday, you have our um, our research project presentations due. Um, so that, you, I that's didn't a, think... right, that is two weeks from now, right? Because next oh, week is Thanksgiving. Okay. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, so I'm I'm assuming then between that time, you're gonna go over kind of more of what you want to see as far as- um, Yes, I will do that. I will have that. I'm not going to have you guys take a quiz over Thanksgiving break. Mm -hmm. um, your assignment will be to do the NMR and the IR packet that you're getting mm -hmm. right now and to read everybody's papers. I'll make everybody's papers on um, Canvas. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll, when I post all of those, I will give you more definitive guidelines, but most of the, not that much more definitive because most of what I want you to do is just explain your paper. Um, take okay. as long as you need, as long as it's not longer than 15 minutes. I don't think anybody could explain their paper in less than five minutes. And that's sort of the time window I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. um, you can use PowerPoint, you can use Prezi, you can use, you know, if you have a whiteboard, you can use a whiteboard and then nothing else. Um, you okay, can so screen share, or whatever works for you. Uh, okay, so you do want some kind of visual. I don't think any of you have a paper that you could explain without a visual of some kind. Okay. You all have proteins or molecules that you're going to want to show. Um, and screen share will work. Um, I would like you to make it a little bit more polished than, than just sort of scrolling through a PDF on screen share. Um, mm -hmm. But you can definitely just screen grab the, the figures from your paper and put it into a PowerPoint. But I, just, I do want to give it a little bit more structure than just sort of scrolling through it. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And check the, the assignment has a rubric for how I'm going to grade those. And there is going to be a portion of your grade that's based on um, how well or did you read everybody else's papers. And I'm going to grade that. I usually do that by having you ask a question. Um, if you okay. don't get a chance to ask a question, then just write it down on your paper and then mm -hmm. submit it. Um, you okay. get a, that'll be a portion of your grade. So you do have to read everybody's to some extent, not super in depth like yours. You for your paper, you guys are all expected to be the experts. Um, probably more than I will know about these specific applications because I don't know every enzyme in the world out there. 
Um, so you guys are expected to be the expert, be able to ex not answer any question, but general questions. Um, and I will give you, that is a um, little bit of a tip when you're designing your presentations. Don't try to cram too much in. If you feel like you have to skip out on your background to explain more or that you don't wanna to go too in depth because you won't be able to get through the whole paper, um, you can always kind of leave little blind spots in your presentation where you kind of are anticipating that that'll allow you to kind of figure out where people's questions are gonna come from. It's sort of making it look like you don't have anything prepped there or that you don't, didn't explain something well enough because you didn't have time. And then when you get to the Q&A part at the end, you know that that's gonna be the part that people ask about. It sort of gives you a heads up so you're not blindsided by questions. Um, so when in doubt, if you're like, well, I could cram another three figures into this slide, um, but then I'm, you know, it's gonna be really hard to read, probably don't do it and just be ready for questions about that. Um, and that's just, that's just good science advice. And it's not really cheating, it's just allocating your time wisely so that you know where people are going to push you on some of this stuff. Otherwise, if you explain everything perfectly and somebody comes up with a really good question you hadn't thought about yet, you're gonna be, you might be totally blindsided and have to think on the spot. But if you can direct them, say, I'm pretty sure somebody's gonna ask about this, you can be ready for it a lot better. And, and it comes off as being really a lot more knowledgeable um, as well as being really well prepared. So just a good tip for presentations in general. All right, any other questions? All right, we've got a bunch of these to work on. I don't expect you to sit here and keep working on it. It's now dark outside, we have snow coming tonight. Um, so feel free to keep working on it. I'll leave my Zoom on and, and hang out here to answer questions, but I would probably encourage you guys to take a break at this point um, and come back after you've eaten some food. And, uh, and start working on it. And we can go over some more of these in class two um, on um, Thursday after you've had a chance to come up with some questions. All right? Thanks, Sean. No problem. Have a good one if you're logging off. Otherwise, I'll be here for a bit still. Hey, Sean, can I ask you a quick question about last week's lab? Yeah. Uh, for that second IR spectrum for the lemon oil, um, I think I'm seeing a carbon oxygen double bond, um, but it's not indicated in the, the structural formula. So when I got to the part about drawing it, I was wondering if I should draw, include an oxygen because it's um, in a different molecule or, or not. So usually the, the molecular formulas are usually more ironclad than, than the IR spectrum is. Okay. If there is something that you think that you say, okay, that might be a carbonyl, or I'm pretty sure that's a carbonyl, but it's not in the formula. There's no oxygen in the formula. You, it's probably either impurity or it's something else showing up in the same region. Cause I, think wasn't there a specific class of alkenes that might show up in there too um i'm not sure Let's see. Uh, so aromatics usually show up a little bit lower but right around 1600 is where you would see an alkene carbon-carbon bond. And those ranges are sort of guidelines more than rules, with the exception of the 3000 number for sp2 versus sp3. Okay. So if you, if you think you've got something in the right range, but it's not in your molecular formula, trust the molecular formula over the IR, because things get wiggly in the IR. Okay. I just remembered you saying um, about the extraction for lemon that there'll be different 
different molecules as opposed to just eugenol for, for clove. So I was kind of thinking maybe, you know, maybe it's uh, something else. It, yeah. it certainly could be some impurity with that strong of a peak. Usually impurities would show up as weaker peaks because you have less of them. Okay. Um, but it's definitely, it's less than 1700, right? It's like it's 1640, if I'm judging there, yeah. which means your 1640 is right at the very bottom of where you might see a carbonyl and right at the very top of where you might see an alkene. So that in mind it, and the formula, it's probably more indicative of an alkene than, than the, your formula being wrong. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. All right. I'm getting out of here later, Sean. Have a good night. No, have a good one. Thanks, John. See you next week. See you, John. Thursday. I mean, Thursday. Hey Sean, when are you going to make that um, the reading the papers? Is that due after Thanksgiving break or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it, the the next deadline you have for the presentations is the is the presentation itself, which is two weeks from today, I think. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, you said you're going to post everyone's papers though, or when is that? Yeah. So on probably Thursday sometime tomorrow or thursday i'll i'll post everybody's papers okay um and then so you're expected to at least be able to understand the abstract from everybody's and come up with at least one good question for everybody's um okay everybody else's papers as well as knowing yours front to back um right. and that so you'll have all next week on since it doesn't seem like anybody's going to be going to thanksgiving anywhere uh at Probably this not. point <clears throat> um, to work on this this packet of NMR IR stuff, and I might even push the deadline on that back to the end of the week when we come back. Um, okay. Well. So. Um. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. Next week is going to be great for getting the work done. But that's the thing. I have. I don't expect to have my paper until probably like Saturday or Sunday, maybe uh, the latest. Hopefully midweek. But um, yeah. So I was just trying to. Okay. About that, like, I'm not going to be able to be a part of that, I guess, unless. Well, you, you know, you'll unless, still be able to to read everybody else's, and are you? Yeah, just on sure. Access? Do you have a paper in mind that you just need? I do. Um, do you still want four possibilities? I mean, ideally, but the very least, let me know. Send me um the one that you're feeling really strongly about, and I can get okay. you access probably sooner than that, especially if it's a a journal, if it's a chemistry. It's actually. Journal. 
no i i can get full access to i already found one and um it's it's on a it's a protein or not protein well yeah it is a protein an enzyme uh found in earthworms like bile Mm -hmm. that uh, is really good for blood clotting okay supposedly yeah so yeah Um, uh so i I thought it was pretty actually really interesting but um yeah so so if i can read the whole thing yeah if you get the sooner you don't have to read it before you submit it as your as your option so you can go ahead and